uh, hey, I see we might, might have a visitor from um, Down Under join us. How you doing? Yeah, I'm good, Warren. How are you? Great. Good to see you. Thanks for dropping in. Yeah, my pleasure. Are you curious as to who we are? Yeah, any, that would be fantastic. All right. Well, here we are. G'day, guys. How are you? So a lot of people want to ask the same question, and that is, you know, what is the magic of Bluey? Well, thanks, Warren. Good to good to see you guys. Can I? Where are you all at the moment? We're in in Central California in Monterey, right, right on the tip of the Monterey Peninsula. I, I'm in Brisbane, and uh, I guess part of the magic of Bluey is uh, it is set in my hometown and i think sometimes people you know maybe in the uk and maybe maybe in the dead of winter over there get quite a kick out of seeing blue skies and palm trees and hearing our birds and stuff so you know the 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 landscape of queensland that we put into the show is is definitely part of the magic um i would say i would say at the heart of the of the show though and and i'm hoping I'm hoping is the main reason why it's it's been a bit of a success is that um, kind of like playtime is is front and center in most the majority of the episodes and and my you know my attempt to really get uh, you know to to represent playtime as I saw it with my two young kids when they were you know age four and six when I was writing the show because I learn a lot um, about how they play, what they're playing, you know, why they're playing it, even though they don't tend to, you know, know why they're playing it uh, through making Bluey and through, uh, you know, experiences I had with my daughters, um, you know, when they, when the oldest one started school and playtime was suddenly kind of curtailed and seeing the results of that. I just did a bit of a deep dive into you know, I was already very deep in playing with the kids uh, on a daily basis, but then when I started studying it and and dis really discovering the the field of of you know the, the fact that people have been studying it for decades, uh, I got quite fascinated to be honest. And it was just one of those situations where I could read all this theory and then I could see it in practice. You know, day to day, you didn't have to go out into the field. You didn't have to you know, um, your subjects were right there. And I really, you know, the little, the things that I was learning, I, I thought were really fascinating. And so I just tried to base episodes around that, about what I was learning. And, and so as a result, you know, you, you probably get a show which isn't trying to teach you how to count. It's not trying to teach you, I wouldn't say it's trying to teach you any, ethical even moral sort of lessons or i guess that is on display you can't you can't help that but it is showing the beauty of of that four to six year old's world and their imagination and the role that play has in socializing them uh, and and really that's it and I, I think it's quite nice to watch a cartoon where you're not getting hit over the head and being lectured to and, and taught things, you know, just, just sometimes. Um, so yeah, that, that I think is at the heart of Bluey and, and hopefully what is some of the episodes, you know, it, they do feel a little bit magic because um, I think it's a magic subject. I'd have to agree. Um, th the reason I became so interested was I have a grandson now and um, he's the one who told me to watch Bluey. Right. And, um, and I was like, what, what is this? And I, I immediately recognized the Smolansky, uh, the theory. And I was like, who, how did you do that? I mean, like, um, so I'm a child development person and I get really excited when I hear, kind of see that kind of theory actually implemented. So when you started looking around, how did you come stumble across her work? How did I come across Smolansky? It's a good question. I. My my mum works in or used to work in libraries a lot, and so we used to get a lot of out of print books that she would bring home. <laughs> yeah, because she's out of print. <laughs> yeah, and that must have somehow, you know, it, it was actually a book called Genius of Play, um, which I got through. I was very very close with my kid's school, and and her, I guess you'd call it kin 
it, it was not quite kindergarten. It was the year above kindergarten. The teacher there, and who was very much who I based Calypso on, and she, um, I used to spend a lot of time with her, and I'd sit in the class, and she put me onto a few books. And one of these books, which called The Genius of Play, which was really great, I can't remember the author, kept referencing these studies made by this person, Sarah Smolansky, and and it was seemed very rigorous and very scientific. So I just, I think I just ordered her books online, and I got um facilitating play and just read it back to front and you know it was really um it's it blows my mind that you people all you know who she is like it, it was just the most obscure book for me an animator from Brisbane but it really laid it all out and really helped me clarify what was going on with my kids um facilitating play you know especially the contrast she had with you know with the sort of I guess she had two groups in her um, which I think from memory, she sort of classified as a bit of a low socioeconomic versus a high one. And seeing the contrasts in their play and, and not only their play, but also then their sort of development, you know, like uh, there's an episode in season two called Typewriter, which, which was very much pulled from that book, which was, you know, she would notice that the kids who are a bit more hindered in their play were, were really stuck with the physical object and they had trouble moving beyond that into abstractions. So I, I tried to, I thought that was fascinating. I tried to get that across in the typewriter episode. Uh, there was an episode called Helicopter again in season two, because, um, you know, one of the, Smolansky was very adamant that one of the, one of the benefits that kids at that age get from play is they learn flexibility because they may play the same game day to day, but the players may interchange. And so a game of cafe one day is completely different to the one the next day because you've got this whole new human who's bringing their sets of experiences. And so as a result, you know, the kid learns to, you know, just to be flexible. And I think what fascinates me is all these, these are just the seeds of all these things, which I just see myself using as still as an adult. And it just fascinated me that, oh yeah, you had to learn all this stuff. And then what an amazing way that you had to learn it. So yeah, um, and you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, her experiment was how do you facilitate it? What's the best way to do it? Is it to, you know, bring kids out into the world a lot more and show them how to, you know, you know talk them through these experiences in shops or is it just to sort of play a role in the, the school itself, just in, uh, setting a game up and then not being too involved. Now, Bluey, you know, for reasons that were a little out of my control, has parents who are probably more involved than I would say that experiment um, uh, recommended. But it is a TV show and BBC really like Bandit, so that's the way that went. But, yeah, it, sorry, you guys know all this, but it, it was all new to me and I, I found it endlessly um, intriguing and still do. Great, that was wonderful. Give it up for, for Joe. <laughs> I guess just know your, your work's been noticed and very, it's very appreciated over here. And um, I think it's just the start. I think um, many more people and generations of, of people, young and old, will catch on to the same idea of talking to. We've got some experts here, I'd say experts, media creators and other people that love to um, join in on this conversation in the physical room. Yeah, and so, so go ahead, ahead. Mark. Mark. Thank you. Hi, Joe. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I've got you, Mark. Good day, Mark. Yeah, my, my whole family uh, was excited that I was talking to you. My grandkids were excited that I was talking to you. And uh, they, uh, my, of course, my, my, my son and my grandson wanted to know, are, they, are the characters based on, um, on anyone that you know in particular? Uh, well, yeah, the, the kids are based on my kids. You know, I've got two daughters. Um, and actually, Charlie, the producer, has two daughters, and both my brothers have two daughters, and Dave McCormack, the voice of Bandit, has two daughters. So we're, I'm sort of in this too, although my, I've, now we've just got one nephew. But um, yeah, I was just, uh, well, I was surrounded by nieces and daughters. Uh, and so it, they were always going to be a couple of girls. Um, and that that's just my world. That's what the kids are based on. Uh, Bandit. Yeah, Bandit's probably me on a really good day. I, I'm probably a bit more like <laughs> probably more like Uncle Stripe on an average day, just still feeling his way through. Um, yeah, it's 
yeah, like Nana, the voice of Nana is my mum. Uh, you know, my brother does the voice of Uncle Stripe. A lot of my friends' children do the voices of the kids. The next question was, of course, uh, you have a room full of play experts here who have also been designing software and television for years. And so we're, you know, of course, delighted to meet you. And um, I'm, I'm always, you know, I've, I've done voices, had, had to direct voices for programs where we started with a kid where we had to pitch him um, down. And then he got too old, we had to pitch him up. And the third time we did a, you know, if it was for Arthur way back when. And uh, I'm curious, um, uh, are, are those the same? The voices for the kids are so amazing that I'm, we just wondered if those were adults or were they really kids? Uh, yeah, every kid, every child voice is a, is a, a kid. Um, I years ago I worked on Charlie and Lola as an animator, which is a I don't know if you if you get that over there, but it was a show we made at the bit with the BBC, and it uses real kids for voices. And I just thought, oh, this is this is fantastic. It definitely comes with more challenges, and as you say, you know we're getting to a point where all the kids have aged up, especially the boys. So it it um it does pose some longevity problems, uh, but I think as a trade-off and for all the, the hard work and all that, it, you do feel like you're in a, a real house a bit more. Um, so yeah, no, they're all they're all real kids. That's that's really, um, we're all interested. In fact, my, my own kids have been in a bunch of products over the years and uh, and now they're parents and kids, you know, so it's, it's always wow. interesting. They'll be in, my kids will be interested to hear that. But the great, great coaching with them, we just, We've watched, uh, many of us have watched the series, the first two seasons anyway, several times. Uh, in the evenings, sometimes it's our bedtime treat. You know, it's like, well, okay, something that's not so heavy before bed, we us watch Bluey for a little bit, so. So thank you. I know there's other people that want to talk, so I'm going to pass it on here. No worries, Mark. Hello, Joe, I'm Scott Trailer, a uh, long time children's product developer, and um, recent fan and enthusiast of all your work. Uh, sadly, as everything that is awesome outside the US, it takes a long time to get here. But I'm glad you finally did get here. Um, there are many things that I wonder about. In particular, while I'm not as versed in um, Solinsky's work, I, th I wonder how much are you thinking about um, the mentoring for parents and showing them how they can be a better parent it goes into thinking about you know the storylines and uh and, and the show uh, and the episodes that we make because it feels like um you know this is something even if you don't have children just being a good person you should watch this to learn from yeah thanks for the question i, I no i wouldn't say i i'm trying to impart any um parental advice it, it does happen sometimes because of the nature of the show I, generally what i'm trying to do is show in the parent story just show something that's worked uh or hasn't worked for my wife and myself and and where i can just try and explore both both ways of doing it or both sides you know of of a particular parental technique i think it's a bit too risky for me to start you know, dishing out parental advice. You know, I'd like to see how my kids turn out before that is worth. It might be unintentional, but the modeling is pretty fantastic. I, I think about people who may be struggling with kids, wondering how to engage them, how to engage and play. Uh, it's a really great guide to think about how to really. Yeah, I think I agree with that. And, you know, it's, it's, there's lots of parental techniques that you use in your, in your day. And sometimes it's right to use a playful approach. And I think Bluey is the show that can, that demonstrates that. It, like probably my most um, grandiose aim for the show was just to, to teach parents that play isn't just the kids mucking around, that you should really try and ring fence it and protect it and encourage it and leave it alone when it's happening. And, it, and it's they're not just wasting time they're, they're, there's all sorts of things going on so that would be the most i try to teach but i do i've got a lot of um a few child psychologist friends mates of mine who say look yeah the modeling of, of just a healthy relationship between the parents and between the kids is something that they use in their sessions and 
you know, look, I'm, I've, I love my wife. We love our kids. We're very blessed to, to not have any, you know, money woes or anything like that, um, major ones. So I, I guess that just comes through in the cartoon. And if someone can take some comfort from that, then, then that's good. Do you have a favorite episode of Bluey? Yeah, I've got a couple. Um, and we've got a lot of trumpet in the show, actually. We were just recording some trumpet um, the other day for, for an episode. I went, I went and watched the live recordings. Um, I'm available. Yeah, my favorite episode from season one was, is Calypso. The, the teacher who played Calypso had a very, my, my eldest daughter, just she just did not want to go to school to prep. And we had, I guess it's called school refusal, but we had a year of that until we we found this particular school and the teacher there just she just took her job seriously she knew what kids that age how they worked and she was just excellent at her job and she brought my kid from you know tucked up in the the back of the Subaru not wanting to get out to enjoying school and and loving it and you know when someone does that for particularly for your own kid you you take notice and you start getting interested in how they did it. And so I would just pick her brain at every chance and I would do sit-ins and the events that happen in that Calypso episode, like it's pretty much spot on with what I saw in a four hour session sitting with her. Um, just this, these worlds of different games that were just being, you know, just tied together very loosely, very gently. Um, and yeah, it just you really did just see the future adults in these kids. So there was a little court case going on at one point that was, and just in the middle of it all, this chaos of all these games was this this young girl just building this beautiful um, miniature city, you know. And you'd take your eyes off and you'd follow this game. And I remember just at the end going, oh yeah, look back, and this thing was just amazing, you know. And yeah, it was like she was like conducting an orchestra, and I just thought I, I need to. Uh, you know this I want to ex somehow express this in an episode and you know there's a lot of pushback from um the people uh you know <laughs> that tell me what to do because they're like well you know Bluey's hardly in it you can't have a main character who's a teacher you know as an adult da, da, da. and I just sort of I don't know <laughs> I'm, I'm old enough now when I made the show to not really listen <laughs> to anyone so I just went ahead and did it and yeah it is my favorite app because I feel like it captured um, everything I guess that I, that that I that this teacher did for my kid, and then season two, I, like Sleepy Time and Flat Pack, which um, I think you've just watched Sleepy Time. I mean, Sleepy Time was just it was the most um, when we 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 every Friday night with our team we we show our rushes, you know, what we show an early animatic and we show the work in progress, and then we show a finished step, and it's it's just the heartbeat of our studio we'll have a few beers and i still remember showing the the uh animatic for sleepy time so the first time the crew saw it you know and it was just one of the standout <laughs> friday nights of of my life really and uh it was yeah it's just a special app but flat pack flat pack for me is sort of me at my writing best i guess and just trying to um throw lots of things in there without hitting anyone over the head uh and then season three is just coming out in australia and i've i've got another favorite in that one so yeah they're, they're my three favorites at the um, moment. so tell tell me about the music i mean that that um music and sleepy time is holds planets i mean that that's not watered down stuff and it's absolutely beautiful um somebody cares a lot about music it, on uh, in the in the bluey uh mix room who is that in the bluey verse well well look it, you know to be to be honest it starts with me i know how i'm i'm a i play in bands and i'm a musician and i i know how important music is and i know it, it's just you know i i, I kind of think of bluey as it's a series of music videos to a certain extent but i know how important that is but i've got you look there's no way around it i've got um, and he will dodge this word as true geniuses do, but it's a guy called Joff Bush, who's our musician. Is he's just one of those genius musicians, and and you know not not in a way where he could get up and and hold a gig and and all that, but in a film scoring cinematic um, way, he just 
which is a very it's a very different skill to the, that the average composer has. Um, he just knows how to to um, to make a seven minute score just move and do what it needs to do and to mark moments and yeah bluey wouldn't be you we wouldn't all be sitting here talking about it i don't believe without um without his contribution but i was the one who wanted Hulse planets i'm just gonna stand by that thank you very much yeah man that's uh that's heavy stuff and um I, I like how you don't water stuff down for kids. So. But there seems to be an element, I wonder if you also know stand-up comedy because definitely with Louie's dad, it's like, yes, and. Oh, we're gonna go to the circus. And the dad, be, well, it'll be with monkeys and there'll be clowns and always adding the yes, and. So I, throughout your shows, I keep thinking there's that quality, that improv quality, and whether you're aware of it or it's intentional or not. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that sort of rule of, of improv. It's, it's definitely, a, I don't have any stand-up experience, um, personal experience in my life. But yeah, you are kind of like a bit of a, a stand-up comedian when you, when you try and engage with four-year-olds. And, you know, probably one of the most satisfying <laughs> stories, one of our crew members, Liam, he's a young girl. They're all young kids. He's like 23. And he once came back after a weekend and said, hey, man, I, I was with my um, niece or nephews, you know, and I had taken care of them and I, they wanted to play. And I didn't really know what to do. So I just sort of channeled Bandit and and he said it was it was great. And I, I took I thought that was great because it, you, you learn on the job when you've got kids. Um, you know, they kind of like it's going to sound weird, but they like being. They like it when you're, you know, or mine like it when you're really over authoritative and but they get the better of you. And, and yeah, there's no reason not to say yes to it, is there? You know, you, it's like you're in, you're in a world with very few rules. Um, David. 35 year children's media veteran, headed off next week to the International Children's TV Festival at Prisoners in Germany, where uh, Louis is competing for the. the one of the awards, so congratulations on, on the nomination. But what I want to know is, yes. we often see shows that are global, that can go global because they have no particular culture. This is a show that is really deeply rooted in Australian culture, it feels like, but it, can, it feels like it can travel anywhere. I just wonder, do you have a sense of how many countries it's in now? Is there anywhere where it just hasn't worked? And was that part of the goal to make something that play anywhere in the world without losing the, the roots? Yeah, obviously you want the show to, to go overseas. Australia is a small market, although the ferocity of which of which Australia have taken up Bluey is, it's it's pushed it into like, you know, it's competing with the UK and the US. Uh, yeah, I wanted it to travel. I was, but I had no idea whether it would, um, you know, we're kind of three quarters funded by the Australian taxpayer. So I had a duty to make this um, for them, for us. So I didn't water any language down. Uh, I, you know, the, there was no intention to revoice in other um, English speaking countries. And, you know, even now, I think the Disney and, and BBC have stopped asking for translations of, you know, capsicum and things like this. So no, I, I was quite surprised with the, with the pickup that it's had in the US and the UK. And, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, what it is. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I wanted it to make it local, but it's not so local that you just feel like you're, you know, it's a big in joke, you know, like you don't need to know the place names and all that. And look, at the end of the day, it is parenting and it is being a kid and play that it's at the center of it. And, you know, we grew up with American cartoons, you know, where you end shows all, all our lives where you just had to do a bit of mental translation. And, you know, I found that, and I still find that quite fun. And, and so I think we're, you know, for overseas audiences, they're having to do the same thing. And I actually think it's, it can be quite a little fun game for the kids to figure out, oh, they call this or that, or that, that must mean that. Um, look, it's in, I know it's translated into 80 languages. I think probably the one heartbreaking thing for me is that most of the translations actually use adults for the kids. Voices. Um, and I put so much time into picking each individual take. So I've got no, no idea um, what, how it sounds to a French audience or how it sounds to a Japanese audience, but it seems to be doing okay there. Um, I think China, 
China, is, <laughs> we had a bit of a trade war with them recently and uh, I think they're kind of sitting on it at the moment, but the plan is to try and um, get it to catch on there as well. But no, uh, other than that, it's, it's doing really well. My, uh, my grandson, uh, who's uh, three and a half, um, mostly was speaking Vietnamese because his, his mother's Vietnamese and we're teaching him bilingually. And he was used to call his dad by the Vietnamese name. And then all of a sudden he's going, Dad, with an Australian accent. And now his one-year-old brother is, is doing it. That's how they call their dad, but they, have, they call him with, with an Australian accent. From so, watching movies. Thanks a lot, Joe. You've got no idea how much joy that brings me. <laughs> uh, knowing, knowing that it's only temporary, but that, might, that brings you a lot of joy. Question back there. Hi, Joe. I'm Veronica Wolf. I work in Sesame Workshop's International Production Department. Um, I have a question about your script writing process. You know, for us, I feel like that's one of the biggest challenges is getting a really good script. Can you tell us a little bit about what goes into your scripting process? Yeah, for sure. Um, so 99% of the scripts are written by me. Uh, I do have co-written a few with some of my animators, um, usually two, maybe one or two or three per season. Uh, but for the, the vast majority of them are written by me. And yeah, it's, I kind of just usually come up with, I usually just try and think of something that's really a, you know, like it can start with something like I was talking about before, just something I've found from, from research, you know, like, oh, this is an intriguing thing. Like, uh, you know, there's an episode in season two called Library where Muffin realizes she's not special. And, and that came from reading, you know, that games are really good because you, it's a good place to learn that you're not special, that you have to follow the same rules as everyone else, which is really good for a three to four year old to learn. And, and that's perfect for me because it's really, it's counterintuitive and it's a bit punk rock. It's like the opposite of what, you know, you, it's like, oh, my child's so special. And it's like, no, no, they're special, but they're also not special. And that, so that's the perfect sort of little jump off point for me. Uh, other than that, it's usually I'll start with something that I just see happening around my house a lot and with my kids a lot, you know, like um, usually it, sometimes it can be a game. We would always play hotel and there'd just be permanently little numbers stuck up on our doors. And I would just think, all right, I want to build an episode around that. Uh, or, you know, you know, the granny's episode was, was it's like, look, you know, you know, they were arguing about who was right. And it's like, you just look, sometimes kid, like just, you can sit here arguing and, and you can be right, but you've just, you're going to upset your sister. She's not going to play with you. Um, so usually just these little things in my life, which are quite, um, I know I've got a bit of an emotional charge to it, will form the first sort of the, the purpose of the app. And then usually I'll just stick it. I'll, I've got all these games that I play written down and I'll just try and find a game that kind of works with that. And then, then I just lie there and I just, you know, and I've said this before, but then someone asked me, look, what, what's your attitude to play these days, you know, when you're an adult and other than sport and stuff, probably the closest point now is this point in the script where I'll just lie there and I will just play with the ideas in my head and on paper, just sketching. Uh, wouldn't that be fun if we move that there? You know, maybe this game of like, um, you know, magic xylophone would work with this theme, you know, because they're related and you just play with it. And I don't know how, <laughs> but within a few hours, sometimes this, this little um, story arc is there you know, a little, a little character journey. And then, then the sort of work begins. And I, I really, I really love community. It's my favorite um, show. I think it's one of the best written shows on television. And so I just, you know, I really like, I was really inspired by the way Dan Harmon uses the, this, his version of the story, um, the sort of hero's journey. And I'll try and get, I'll just try and follow um, that for my seven minute episode. And then I just draft and draft and draft and before you know it. And then at some point I show up to my script editor, Charlie, and he usually has a few notes and then, then it's good to go. Um, and then I do a hell of a lot of changes at the animatic stage because I'm there in the edit suite. And, and sometimes, you know, I'll even change the script at, a, um, at an animation stage. And 
that's one of the big things with Bluey is we did it. What I learned in London was that we could do it all in under the one roof. So script to screen is all done in Brisbane. And it just gives me that freedom to just whenever I need to drop in at any point to an episode to tweak something, I can. Um, and that that's one of the biggest gifts for me as a script writer, knowing that I'm not just going to hand this script over and then just hope for the best. It's like I know there's so many visual jokes in my scripts that I, I like being there through the whole process to make sure it all works. I'm the digital producer for the show Adam's Way and Daniel Tiger. Uh, I'm a huge fan of um, Bluey, but more than me, I have a five-year-old and she, we have the song playing day and night. Like I have the do 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 Oh, oh, I'm working and I'm just singing that song, so I wanted to say that. But I have a couple of questions. One, you were mentioning right now Muffin, and I was wondering if you could talk about that character a little bit, because I feel that it's kind of a representation of a bad kid, like this is, this is a kind of a, a kid that is out of control, and he's doing all the things that parents and teachers are like, oh my god, why are you doing that? <laughs> and I feel that it's solved in such a way that you feel that this is a real kid. Like it's going through so many things that even the family, I feel that the mom, um, one of my favorite episodes is when, when they have the, the shame cone. And, and Muffin is like, uh, no, I'm, you know, I'm so ashamed. And the mother is ashamed as well. And it's a big deal. And then the way it was transformed into a game, it was just beautiful. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the inspiration for the, for the character and the development of the character as well. Yeah, no worries. Thanks. Not, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, I love Muffin. She does divide the audience a bit, but I feel like it divides the people into <laughs> who've got three-year-olds and who, who doesn't. <laughs> um, look, you know, kids' ages, kids, before I had kids, kids' ages were like, you'd say, how old's that kid? And I'd go, oh, I don't know, like, you know, or, you know, what's the, what's the difference between a six-year-old and a three-year-old? And and I, I never would have known, but uh, once I had kids and then once I started studying play, I kind of got to know what the ages were very uh, in a lot of de detail. And, you know, as you know, I'm sure there's, there's a massive difference between a three-year-old and a four-year-old. There's, there's a massive difference between a two-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, you know, the Bluey and Bingo are four and six, and that's for, uh, the reason for that is it's the it's sort of the entry and the outro point for that socio-emotional um, uh, phase of their lives. And so that's what the show is about. It's about, and, you know, as Smolansky said, um, amongst others, that socio-dramatic play is the best sort of fodder for that age because they're, they're really starting to go, oh, yeah, I'm not just, I mean, what, like, Think about it, what are they coming out of? They're coming out of the muffin three-year-old, which is, you know, they've only recently realized that they're separate to their mum, you know, that they're a separate sort of entity, but they are entirely and beautifully, I will add, self-centered. You know, that's that three-year-old toddler where it's just, everything's mine and it's this and that. And, and they have to go through that phase. They're still getting their, you know, their fine motor skills together, but they have to go through that phase and then enter this four to six year old phase of, oh, actually there's other kids around and I want to play with them. And none of my three year old, you know, habits are, gonna, are going to help me in getting a, a social game going and keeping it going because it's just the most beautiful thing. It's like, if the, they want to play the game together, but if two of them are arguing over who should be what, the game just grinds to a halt and no one's happy. So there's that beautiful thing happens where someone just takes, takes one for the team. And the four-year-old says, yeah, all right, you be this person, I'll be that person. That way the game gets going. No parent has to be involved in that. No teacher has to be involved with that. It's just the, the desire to play the game uh conditions their behavior and so muffin is three like she is she's there to show 
the phase that Bluey and Bingo have just come out of. And she's there for my entertainment. I just, I just love the chaotic element of that. But I tried my best to go, you know what, this kid isn't four and she's not two. She is a three-year-old and they can be like this. You no. Know? And yeah, I, I love it. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm, um, I was involved with some of the stuff with the BBC in, in the UK. And for the developers in the room, I was really interested to, um, I know you're changing licensees for the toy manufacturers and if there's any lessons you can share on the kind of the licensing journey and also what your plans for Bluey, or have you got any plans for Bluey in the metaverse? Bluey, Bluey went in the metaverse in that uh, sleepy time, Lauren. Isn't that the metaverse? I'll be honest with you, I'm still, um, I wouldn't clearly be able to tell you what the metaverse is. Um, I have bought some VR goggles. I, I know that's got some to do with that. So uh i i'm yeah i there may be plans but i don't know what they are uh, but once i figure out what the metaverse is I'll, I'll let you know i want everything i want the brand i want i want everything to have that core value of the show and both from an aesthetic point of view and or whatever and but to just the physical reality of, of me trying to be involved with all of that and produce the show just was never going to work so i had a bit of involvement with the the style guides and all that but um, it was a very steep learning curve for me, just the physical barriers of licensing and product size and packaging and all this. Um, you know, there's, it's a, yeah, it's been a real learning curve for me that you, it's, you're not as free to do things that you would want to, that you could do in a cartoon just because there's, there's so many um, requirements. Um, but yeah, it's, I feel like in the last year, the, the stuff is getting a bit more like on brand. I think initially my experience with it was before it was really big in the UK um, was, well, let's just do what Paw Patrol did. And that wasn't really what uh, I thought we were two different shows. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't, uh, it was soon clear to me I was not playing a very central role in that. So I just stepped out. Joe, we don't want to keep you too much longer because it's Saturday where you are and you need to go play with your daughters. Um, yeah, no worries. Um, there are some online questions that have popped up and uh, I know Kathy, you have a question too. So let's do Kathy and do the online ones and then we'll let you go play, jump on the trampoline. I do content design in the US researching kids media. As you're talking about evolving your scripting and animation process, whether you test out your ideas at any of those stages with um, kids and with families and how that has changed the design of any specific episode of you. I think I heard your question. Was it, do we test the episodes out on an audience? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, not, not in a like, regular and official way um which would probably would have been a good idea to do it uh i think what, what i do I do test them informally on my kids which has been good because a few of them i have learned a lot um that you know i got quite sensitive kids but they you know just i never wanted any monsters or anything in this show or anything that could be even slightly considered scary but i did realize as i've made it um that just just certain scenes would sometimes scare my kids like there's an episode daddy robot which used to when they were um the mum and the kids were sort of operating on him it was all i wanted to go very sci-fi and blade run it was already blue and he was face down and they couldn't see his face and my kids watched it and they just really didn't like it it was really scary and i so i i would i have learned a lot along the way of you know what like four-year-old kids are really young and you have there's a tremendous responsibility not to not to show them images that they're not ready to handle um you know like a a, a story is one thing because the kid has control of the images you know of a witch in their mind but you can't you know just showing them a really scary picture of a witch um is is you've got to be super careful with that. So no, we don't have any formal um, testing. It was, and I still remember when the first time we showed an episode to some kids before it went to air, I just thought, man, we 
I haven't shown this to any kids. Like, are they even going to like this? And I remember thinking really nervously and then they were laughing their heads off and I thought, ah, oh, we'll be right. Um, but no, the answer is no, but we probably should have. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a couple, just, just a couple more questions. And um, I haven't asked, I, I know there's some participants who want to uh, unmute and ask a question, but Scott, sure. go ahead, I'll serve uh, you. I, I'm asking a question for uh, Kate Highfield online. She asks, uh, why the seven minute format? And then after that, I will hand it over to Adeep online to ask his question if he can unmute. Yeah, good question, Kate. No real um, meaningful answer. I thought Peppa Pig was quite short and Charlie and Lola was a bit long. <laughs> Charlie and Lola was 11, Peppa was five. So I just thought, you know what, seven's the magic number. <laughs> and sometimes I wish it was longer, but I, I do think it's, it's, a, it's a good length to get a little three acts out, you know, even if your final act is the final shot of the episode. Hey, thank you. And uh, Lee? Yeah, uh, oh, I just wanted to quickly say, I'm also a trumpet player and I actually played trumpet in Brisbane like a million years ago on tour, which is so oh, random. So my spit is somewhere in your town. Um, nice. I had a question, is, was co-viewing a part of the original plan, you know, having a strong co-viewing experience for, with Louis or you just sort of went and did what you do and let it go? Yeah, it was always there from the get-go. Uh, I, I love other co-viewing shows for different ages um and and so this was a, definitely a challenge it was like how do we you know how do we get four four-year-olds and 40-year-olds but now i wanted to i mean i'd sat through a lot of kids shows which um i'm an animator so i, I get a bit picky about animation so i wanted a show well not so much a show i wanted an experience of for the kid where their parents are on the couch with them genuinely laughing at their show I just thought, you know, if kids are going to watch TV, that, that's quite a nice experience to have. Um, and I hope, you know, I hope we've, we've done that and I hope that is a nice little memory for those kids. And not, you know, pretending to laugh, not on their phones, just like genuinely sharing something. I, I, I think I thought that was a, a good goal and definitely made it more difficult, but I think it's ultimately why Bluey is caught on. I mean, I have, I have two daughters just like you and they're 10 and four and they're like Bluey and Bingo right now, like tearing the house apart. Uh, and we watch it, we watch it all together. If Bluey is on, then I'll like, oh, is it Bluey? And I'll sit down and, and watch. And then if they switch to something else, I walk out, so. Well, yeah, and, and look, never in our wildest dreams did we think we would be drawing nine and 10 year olds in. Let's say we, we aimed it at four to six year olds, but the fact that we get nine and 10 year olds still watching it is, is uh, still amazing to me. Yeah, it's excellent. Well, I know all that. I'm, I'm a 63 year old who's been watching it. So. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, uh, Joe, keep doing what you're doing. Don't lose focus. And um, it's so kind of cool that we've had three continents all on this conversation. And, um, you know, we're able to. Uh, ask you questions and communicate. And I think that might be the metaverse, Rob, and Rash is over here. Uh, so. Uh, Looking forward to season three. Oh, what's coming in season three? I don't know. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of obscure Australian sports, like rugby league <laughs> and cricket. You're gonna, you're gonna have to be trying to figure out the rules of that for your kids. It <laughs> should, be, should be fun. Um, yeah, I love season three. Lots of, uh, there's going to be a wedding. Um, yeah, it's, it's, there's some of my favorite apps. Well, you're, you're uh, to quote Fred Rogers, you're making goodness attractive and you're using the power of the, the pipeline to reach so many kids with that. And so your message that you're sending has been heard here and, and, and hope you understand that. So thank you for the good work you're doing. And, and I'd like to, Close out with uh, us all singing the Bluey theme. The wait's really for us. It was one of my boys who realized that uh, in the beginning there that they were doing like musical chairs. Well, yeah, musical statues, yeah. And, and I lost it. 40 times and I never noticed it. And one of my kids goes, oh yeah, I don't you notice that every time somebody stops and moves, 
Oh, you know what? When we when I was first doing the credit sequence, um, I wanted it as short as possible. I liked how Peppa Pig was short. And, you know, I don't, I don't like in kids' cartoons how the, the script and the storyboard has come up. I just wanted to get rid of all that, that, those, um, that grammar. And so I wanted just five second, 10 second credits. And, but Ludo were like, no, no, you have to have be a certain length. ABC needed a certain length. And I went, uh, all right. And then it just hit me. I was like, man, I should just have a game of, like all I wanted, like Peppa Pig is, this is my mum, this is my dad, this is my brother and I'm Peppa, let's get going. That's, that's appropriate for a seven minute cartoon. Um, and then I came up with the idea of like, oh man, what if they're playing musical statues? Because all you do in that is dance and yell out single names, you know? Um, and so suddenly I wanted a, a long credit. So I was like, oh yeah, yeah, give me 25 seconds. So yeah. the first ep the episode, there's an episode in season three called Musical Statues where they play the game for real. So I'm hoping that then clears up any um, confusion as to the titles. Thank you so much. I'm still not tired of it. I'm still not tired of music. Yeah. Oh, I, I watched. I watched all two seasons twice now. Let me on my own music. Look at it. Lo love the bingo episode where bingo wins. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Apparently that freaks a few kids out. They just like. Do you have any? Do you have dogs? I work. <laughs> you... Uh, you know what? I I grew up with dogs and. No, we haven't. We're, we're right on the edge of buying one now. We've had other pets, but um, the kids were pretty full on. We, we weren't ready for another mouth to feed yet, but yeah, it'll, be, it'll happen within a year, I would say. Well, we're all wagging our tail here. So, uh, Joe, thanks again. Um, we really appreciate it. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll hope to talk to you soon. And we'll, we'll be watching you watch, watch watch work. Thank you. Yeah.